Stop it, stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop it. I'm just kidding. Sit down, sit down. What's up, people? How we doing, Summit Park? Man, it's great. It's so good to see all of you here today. And uh, man, I want to take a minute. I want to welcome all of those who are watching online and those who are at our South Campus. Come on, North Campus. Can we welcome everybody who's watching online? Love you guys. And uh, man, welcome, welcome to the fall. And it is, it is crowded in here, all right? So I love it, I love it, I love it. And I'm so glad that you're here today. I also want to encourage you uh, with this. There is room at the 8.30, so you could, uh, you could get up early and come to church. And, uh, or you could sleep in for Jesus and come to the 11.30. Or you can go to the Holy Spirit fire service at 5.30 on Saturday night. Okay, uh, so you can come. Anyways, we have room in those services, but you can come to this service too. We're just glad that you're here. Turn to someone and say, I'm glad you're here. All right, just say, I'm glad you're here. And, uh, man, what a great summer we had, summer at Summit Park. Man, didn't we have great speakers all month, July? It was just so great. Um, every week was just powerful, like powerful services. And, man, for me to be able to get a chance to spend time with those pastors and, and hearing about what God's doing at their church, it was literally like a conference every weekend. And so, man, what a great encouragement it was to us, and we walked away better uh, for it. Last week, it all culminated, though, with Heath Adamson as he brought a great word, and we had 27 people make decisions for Jesus Christ just last weekend. Come on. Can we thank God for that? That's incredible. I love it. I love it. Summer has just been so good. We also had three missions trips go out this summer. So we had a missions trip to Africa, Honduras, and then Los Angeles. And, and next year, we're planning for five missions trips. So if you're interested in being a part of those, uh, make sure you stop by the info bar for more information. You can go online to our website. But man, we are moving forward. We had a great outreach Tuesday where we handed out backpacks. We gave away 107 backpacks and 90 new pairs of shoes just on Tuesday. Tuesday. So it's just so cool to see what God's doing. And man, I love, love, love our church. And so thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart because I love being a part of a church that is leaning in, that is growing, that wants all that God has, and then also wants to be a conduit of all that God is doing, right? Because we are blessed to be a blessing. And man, it's fun to see it happening. It's just really, really cool. And then this month is going to be incredible because we are starting our 30 for 30. And if you've never done this or if you've done this every year, I want to encourage you to jump in. So we're taking 30 days. We're spending 30 minutes with God. And you could do this a variety of ways because some of you think 30 minutes, man, the longest prayer I've ever had is like 30 seconds and that's pushing it. You know, you're like, like, how do I do that? Well, don't feel pressure. You can spend time reading the Bible. You can spend time worshiping, listening to worship music and start talking to God. And you'll, you'll be surprised at how quickly 30 minutes will go by. But even if you spend five minutes, 10 minutes, stretch yourself. Maybe by the end of the month, you're spending 30 minutes. However you do it, spend time every day with God. And I promise you this, you will look different than you do right now. Your spirit, your heart, God will speak things to you. He will encourage you. He will refresh you. And it's going to be really, really cool. And a great way to start that off again is first Wednesday, this Wednesday. It's a great service. It's worship. It's prayer. And uh, it's a chance to really grow. And we like to say it's fire. Okay. We like to say it's fire. Not fire. Fire. So I'd like to have you come. It's going to be great. And today we're starting XO. Okay. We're starting a series on love in relationships. And we're calling it an XO, and you're like, why XO? Some of you are like, what's XO? That means hugs and kisses, y'all. That means hugs and kisses. So it's going to get saucy, okay? It's going to get a little bit saucy. Turn to someone and say, it's going to get saucy, okay? Tell them it's... And then turn to the other person, but say, not too saucy. Turn to the other person and say, not too saucy, okay? <laughs> not too saucy. Easy, easy. And this is going to be helpful for everybody, okay? So if you've never dated anybody or if you feel like you've dated everybody, this is going to be helpful for you, okay? This is going to be encouraging. If you're married and you're excited about it, this is going to be for you. If you're married and you're like, God help, this is going to be for you. Or if you're anywhere in between. And, uh, or if you know someone 
in any of those categories. So that's why this is for everybody because we're all in relationships with people who are in relationships. And, and I want to just let you know up front, just as we jump into this, that, that I am not an expert. Uh, uh, my wife and I, Jen, we are, we are not experts. Um, we've made plenty of mistakes. I've made some. She's made plenty more than I have. And some of you are like, I think you just made a mistake right there doing that. Um, and, and, and we've made mistakes. We're on, a, we're on a journey. We don't have this figured out, but we're learning, and God's helping us, and there are principles we're all applying, and we're, we're, we're growing, and we're not where we used to be. And so, and, and I want to encourage you with that, because that's my, 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 my hope and my prayer for this series, is that we will be strengthened and built up. And I also want to give you some resources, okay? So I'm going to throw some, some books on the screen, and these will be helpful to you. So if you have your phones, get ready to take notes or take a picture, this will be helpful to you. These are some great books, because a lot of times you'll go to Amazon and you're like, what books should I buy? What books should I get? These are some of my top recommended books, okay? The Mingling of Souls. Uh, by Matt Chandler and Swipe Right by Levi Lusco. Really great material there, okay? Really, really great material. I've used a lot of, I've recently read those again. And then The Meaning of Marriage by Tim Keller is a classic. I absolutely love it. Intended for Pleasure, His Needs, Her Needs, The Five Love Languages, Love and Respect. All of these are just classic and they're so helpful. And um, I want to encourage you to take, take some time. Uh, that should give you enough t- for this week, and then I'll have some more <laughs> for next week. But I want to pass out a few resources, okay? I thought I'd do that. So the hosts are going to come down. We're going to pass out some resource. Um, but let me just find out who, who we got here today. Uh, how many single people do we have in the house, okay? Uh, now, that's very nice, single people. Just I mean, but that's not how you get attention, okay? That's just... <laughs> That does not work. So how many single people do I have in the house? Okay, we're going to have to work with you. Okay, that's what the series is about. All right, single people, you're not getting any books. Um, how many of you are in a relationship and you love it? Come on, let me hear you. Yeah. All right. Good, good, good. How many of you are in a relationship and you uh, don't love it? Do not raise your hands. Do not. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. It will not go well for you if you do. Um, Okay, we are going to get vulnerable, though. That's how I'm going to give these books away. We're going to get vulnerable. And I want to ask you, okay, this is going to be a little awkward, but we're going to have some fun. Okay, so how many of you are in a relationship and you've had a fight, a disagreement, an argument, okay, this year. You've had a fight this year. Raise your hand. Yeah, look at we're all messed up. <laughs> we are all messed up. Okay, okay. So how many of you have had a fight in the last month? You've had a fight in the last month. Raise your hand. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll get to you. We'll get to you. I love it. That's what we need. Honesty. All right. How many this week? You've had a fight this week. Yeah, my wife was in an earlier service, and, and I had my hand down, and she had it up. So I was like, I guess I have to put it up, because <laughs> apparently, apparently we have. I forgot. Uh, but she didn't. Come on, you know that's right. <laughs> she doesn't forget anything. Okay, all right. How many, how many had a fight on the way to church? Okay, just raise your hand. Give these people some resource. Give these people... All right, you can have your hand up if you got a fight this week. If you got a fight this week, all right, hold your hand up or on the way to church. All right, we got some resource passed out. All right, um, let's give everybody a big hand. All right, just give everybody a big hand. Because we need it. And we'll have more resource every week. We're going to give resource out, so come back, and it's going to be encouraging to you. Um, but relationships, man, they're so great. They're so great. But if you're going to get started in a relationship, all my single people, if you're going to get started in a relationship, you have to be equipped. You have to be equipped. And so what I want to do over the next few moments, I want to equip you to take that next step in your relationship. And the only way you will be able to do that is with a good pickup line. So I'm going to give you some good pickup lines. All right, just as a way to have some fun, okay? This is, a, this is some pickup lines that you can use. You can take these. You can write these down. Take these notes. All right. Uh, I have to kind of get into a zone, all right? It's like a whole thing. 
baby, you're so sweet. You put Hershey's out of business. Courtesy laughs are encouraged and appreciated. All right, here's one. I like this one. Girl, you must be a keyboard because you're just my type. <laughs> All right. I like this one personally. Girl, we should get some coffee because I'm liking you a latte. <laughs> oh, you be like that one, right? Okay. Okay. Okay, but you know, so maybe you got some pickup lines. What about some Christian pickup lines? Because we are in the house of God. And uh, we are Christians, and, and, you know, you want to, maybe in the lobby after service, you could apply some of these right here. here. Here's some Christian pickup lines. Girl, you and me, we're like loaves and fish. We could be a miracle. <laughs> miracle. Um, okay, here's one. Here's one. Hey, girl, I was doing my devotions earlier today for six hours and uh, was reading through the book of Numbers, realized I didn't have yours. <laughs> <laughs> Write it down. Write it down. <laughs> or how about this one? Girl, your, na your name must be Faith. Because you're the substance of things I've hoped for. <laughs> you scripture, you automatically get the blessing of God. It just <laughs> automatically happens. Okay, all right. That's helping you out. I do want to equip you. So here's how we're going to do this series. All right, this is how we're going to lay this out. Today, we're going to do part one. We're going to do three-part series. Part one, this is defining the relationship. So we're going to define the relationship. Number two, next week, we are going to build the relationship. So we're going to be building the relationship. And then week three, we're going to be protecting the relationship. And I promise you, come every week, this is going to equip you. This is going to build you. This is going to help you. Because I've been praying, literally, uh, for months on this series and reading and researching, and I really believe, especially coupled with 30 for 30, this could be a game changer. I'm praying that's a game changer for our relationship. I'm praying that's a game changer for every relationship in our church, and I believe that it absolutely will be. And so today, we are starting with define the relationship, okay? This is the infamous DTR. Everybody say DTR. DTR. Okay, so before you go Facebook official, before you go Instagram official, before you go Snapchat official, whatever your official is, you have to have a DTR. You have to define the relationship. Okay, remember the define the relationship talk? Like, usually in a relationship, you'll have several of them, right? You'll have multiple define the relationships. Like, when you first start dating, I remember for, for Jen and I, we, we uh, first started dating. We were dating for a couple months, and we, you know, we were just, you know, talking. We went out to this restaurant. It was Bambino's in Springfield. Never forget it. We're at this table, and, you know, it's awkward because you're, like, saying, I, I like you. You know, I want to, like, you know, be your boyfriend, you know. Will you be my girlfriend? So you're just like, it's awkward, right? This is an awkward moment. So you're leaning in, and you're like, hey, it's just been really good spending time. And her voice, Jen's voice, if you've ever talked to her, it's so cute. It's, like, just had me just at the first. But she's like, yeah, it's been great. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. She's like, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, do you want to be boyfriend, girlfriend? And she's like. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, yeah. I was so pumped, all right? I was so excited. So now that we define the relationship, then a few months later, a couple breakups later, all right? And then we get together, and, and uh, I remember just saying the first time I, I love you to her, and I was like, I love you. I threw it out there. And that's always a risky moment, right? And you're like, ah, I love you. And you're like, are they gonna, they're just going to be like, ignore you? Like that Seinfeld episode where it's like, I, I'm not even paying attention. I don't hear it. Um, but she responded, I love you too. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And then a few months later, we were in front of a few hundred people. And we took, we defined our relationship again. And, and I said, I do. And she said, I do. And I was like, yes. And we are celebrating 11 years of marriage in September, everybody. <laughs> it's, it's so great. It's, it's so amazing. And the reason I take time to tell you that is because when you define, every time we define the relationship, we took our relationship 
to another level. You, you always do this when you define the relationship. And let me give you a, a thought that if you're taking notes, you could write this down, and it's this. When you define the relationship, you give the relationship identity, substance, and security. And it always goes to the next level. It's really hard to have a real relationship unless you define the relationship. And we live in a culture that has become very loose with the definition of relationship. And this is why you see couples that are in limbo. Do you see this today? Like, it's more prevalent today than ever before. It's like, are we dating? Are we not? Are we, do we like each other? Do we love each other? Or are we just lame with each other? Like, this is just lame. Like, what is this? And what it's done is it's created confusion. And we don't really know where we are or where we're at in the journey. And if, you, if you're watching people as they're dating right now, this is more and more of a thing. Like, uh, where, what, what are we? And, and it's very important that we define the relationship because if we don't, we have this confusion. And you know who loves this? The enemy of our souls, the devil. He absolutely does. Because he loves taking something that God gave to be good to us and making it confusing and frustrating. You have to define the relationship. Because we have people who are looking to, to find what are we? I'm not sure. We're, we're, we're living together, but we're not married. Are we ever going to get married? I don't know. You have to define the relationship. We don't, we, and so we have a whole culture, a whole society that doesn't even know uh, what, what love is, let alone how to find it. And if they do, that they have found it. They're not, they're not really sure. It's like the, the foreigner song, right? It's like, I want to know what love is. You guys remember this back? It was a classic. I want you to show me. I want to feel what love is. I know you can show. You guys know this one? The problem, do you realize the problem with like secular music, all these secular songs are all about love? They don't, they tell you a lot about love. They give you a picture of love, but they don't really define it for you. And if they do, their definition is really jacked up. That's why, that's why I really believe Tina Turner wrote that song, What's Love Got to Do With It, right? Like, like she's just so frustrated. Like, she's, you know, like, man, I've tried this. What does it even matter? She's like, so she's just saying, whoa, what's love got to do with it? Hey, what's love? Come on. Come on, give yourself a big hand. That was a good job. I mean, literally, can I, can I just be honest with you? That picture is absolutely perfect because that's where the world's definition of love leads you. It leaves you frustrated. And it leaves you saying, what has love even got to do with this? I don't know. What are we? And it creates confusion. It creates disappointment. It creates frustration. But that's not what God has for us. Because love, my friends, is the point. It's the reason we're here. And, and I want to I wanna unpack this with you. One of my favorite verses of Scripture, 1 John chapter 4. If you want to turn in your Bibles, if you have your Bibles with you, turn to 1 John chapter 4. This passage of Scripture is absolutely incredible. And, and I would encourage you to take time to read the whole chapter. If we don't have time to read the whole chapter, I want to read a few verses. But this is, man, this is so good. This is so good. But watch, watch what... The guy who was closest to Jesus while he was on this planet writes about love. He says this in verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. But whoever does not love does not know God because God is what? Love. Love. He's the author of love. It's, he's, what, he's where this whole thing comes from. And then he says in, in verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and set his son as an atoning sacrifice. Very important word. We're going to come back to that in a moment. For our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 
No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. So here, let me, can I just break this down for you? What's love got to do with it? Well, here's, here's what love has to do with it. God is love. So when he creates humanity, he creates humanity out of abundance of his what? Love. And then God came as love, love incarnate, son Jesus Christ. He comes as love, ultimately lived a life of perfect love, and then died so that we could experience God's ultimate definition of love in a relationship with him. What does love have to do with it? Mm, everything. <laughs> Love's the point. And that's why as a church, we need to elevate the value of love. We need to elevate the definition of love. We need to define the relationship so we know what it looks like and what it doesn't. So we're going to have a massive DTR today, okay? We're going to define the relationship, all right? So turn to someone next to you and say, it's time to define. All right, turn to someone and say, it's time to define. I just helped some of you who are like in, they didn't do this. You're welcome. But it's time to define. And here, I want to give you a couple definitions, all right? And I'm going to try to move as quickly as I can because i got a lot of content. And all of these will build on each other again. Come back next week. These will all tie together. But let me lay the foundation for you. First of all, real love is God's idea. What do we learn from this passage? What do we learn from the Bible? That real love is God's idea. God is the creator of all things. He's also the creator of love. He creates from love. 1 John 4 says love comes from who? God. Love comes from God. As the creator, he's the authority on the subject. So here's the deal. If we're going to understand love, we can't start right here. You can't start even in your own thinking, whatever I think, whatever I feel. No, you can't start there. You have to start who, with the authority on the subject. You have to go back to the maker to find the instruction manual. So you can't start in your relationship. You have to start, you can't start horizontally. You have to start vertically. In addition, you can't start right here. You have to start at the beginning. What, how God intended this whole thing to go. That's why I always like going back to Genesis when we're trying to understand like a whole picture of things. Genesis kind of lays out how God wanted this whole thing to go. Genesis chapter 2 in verse 18, I want to read this with you. It says, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. And all the dudes said a good amen. amen. Come on, fellas. Where you at? <laughs> it is not good for the man to be alone. Come on, fellas. Yeah. Amen. That's it. Yeah. I will make a helper suitable for him. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from, check this out. This is an amazing verse. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. And he brought her to the man. Come on, you know God is good <laughs> right there. Like that is just like God is like, here, Look, I made this for you. <laughs> and literally, what does the guy do? I mean, he just starts dancing. He literally breaks out into song. Watch this. This is, you'll, in your Bibles, you'll see this is indented. And I love this verse, and you can't read this verse like you read every other verse. You have to read it with a little bit of sauce, okay? You have to read, oh, like, you can't read... The man said, this is now bone of my bones. And that's, you can't read it like that. You have to read it with a little brown. That's exactly what's happening. I mean, he's just like, can you imagine? Like the first time? All right, this is amazing. So I'm going to give you my little R&B funk version of this song. Okay, here it is. This is now bone of my bone. And flesh of my flag. Come on, you snap your fingers a little bit. There you go. Come on, everybody. And she shall be called woman. Woo! Thank you. But he's literally, he's literally like, whoa, God, you're the man. I mean, you're God. You're awesome. Look at that. That's incredible. That is so amazing. 
And that's why the Bible says, and this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. And then I think what is the best verse in the whole Bible, verse 25, Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Man, it's amazing. And then the next verse says, and then they gave each other a high five and a fist bump. It doesn't say that. The reason I take, I want to take time, I have to take time to do this in this XO series because you have to see how much this whole love and intimacy and sex relationship thing is God's idea. God created it, and he created it to be good to us. He literally brings the woman to the man, and, and it's incredible. Do you see how naked and unashamed is so beautiful? Like, there's no separation, there's no baggage, there's no lies, there's no cheating. There's, there's just pure, unadulterated, connected, marital bliss, and it's from God. Why? Because he loves people. And he wants to be good to his people. It's all God's idea. But you got to define it how God defines it. Otherwise, you're going to be confused. You'll be unsure. You'll be all over the place. And God meant for man and woman to come together in holy matrimony. He made us for marriage. In a God-honoring commitment where you say, I'm in and you're in and we're in together and we're going to be together. It's his design. And when you have that, let me just tell you this. This will be encouraging to you. When you have that, you can have the confidence. Literally, you can have the confidence. You say, God, we are doing this your way. We are honoring you. We are bringing you to the centerpiece of our relationship. And we can know that you want to help us that you want to go before us, that you want to be involved. God cares about people, and he blesses the principles that he's enacted. And when you honor him, even as imperfectly as you honor him, as you honor him, he blesses it. And I got to tell you this because I know some of you are in a relationship today, and, and you're here, and, 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 and you're like, man, we came in, and we were the couple who like literally fought on the way to church, and it's been that every day, and maybe you're just struggling. Maybe you're, you're running up against roadblocks. You're frustrated, and you're like, I can't, we can't figure this out. I want you to know that God is for you, and if God is for you, who can be against you? He wants to come through for you, and he wants to help you, and he will. So you say, man, we've got broken pieces. Well, he can bring those together, and he can do something beautiful with them. So it's his idea, and he wants to help. That's the first thing. As you define the relationship, you gotta, you got to define it how God defines it. Secondly, real love won't look perfect. you got to understand this, that as you move forward in that relationship, real love won't look perfect. We all want our relationships to look perfect, don't we? Like, we all want them to look perfect, especially in a day where we have so much of uh, so much influence from other people's best moment on social media, right? Have you ever just been scrolling through and you see someone else's like really great moment and then you look at your moment <laughs> and you're like, how come we don't look like this, right? Have you, have you had that moment where you're like, man, they're just so perfect and everything just looks so great for them. You know, the problem is, is even someone's best moment, which is unfair to compare to, but a lot of those are fabricated. They're not even real. You know, due to the power of technology, you know, it's not even real. Like, for instance, I want to show you our Mother's Day pick, uh, our family's Mother's Day pick from uh, Summit Park here this year. Let me, let me show this to you. Look at that. Isn't that just, yeah, isn't that cute? It's, it's a lie. That is a lie. <laughs> it's so fake. And here's why. Here's why. Because I remember when I saw that picture and I'm like, there's no way that happened. Because what I remember is kids running everywhere and like just being like, mm, get this done. Like literally, I remember that moment. And, um, and they're like, I was like, how did you make, how'd you make that moment look like this? Like, well, we had to take um, multiple images together and take faces off of your kids and put them onto this one. Because your kids are crazy. <laughs> And I was like, I know. That's what I remember. 
And see, we compare, we compare, and it's, it's, it's not even, because let me just be honest, marriage is work. Marriage is work. It's not picture perfect. And if God created it to be good, have you ever wondered why it's so challenging? Have you ever wondered that? Well, the answer, again, is found in Genesis, Genesis 3. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. Then she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were naked. Again, this is, this is the worst verse in the Bible. They realized they were naked, and so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Innocence lost, and shame comes in. And then you see the consequence of the curse in verse 16. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. And all the ladies are like, thanks a lot, God, for that. (laughs) But it's the consequence of sin. This This is what happens when things are broken. This is the consequence of sin. He says, your desire, it's, it's going to be for your husband, and he's going to rule over you. You're going to have this unhealthy desire for your husband, weird infatuation, and you're going to want to control him, and he's going to want to control you, and it's not how God intended it. It's not how God wants it. So let me give you two important takeaways that will help you as you process your relationship. Number one, we start broken. We start broken. This is the the curse of sin. Like we're all born with a sinful nature. We all have this propensity to like take care of ourselves and and not take care of someone else. We want to push ourselves forward. We want to make sure we're taken care of. It's the sin nature. We have that last bowl of cinnamon toast crunch and we don't want to share it because it's ours. (laughs) And we deserve it. We start broken, and then secondly, we experience brokenness. So you start broken, you have a sinful nature, then you experience brokenness. I don't have to ask for a raise of hands for how many people have been through some hurtful experiences in your life. Because I, I'm sure all of us would raise our hand on some level or another, but you, you went to school with kids that were broken, and you had hurtful things happen. You were raised by parents who were broken, had hurtful things happen. You were, have been in relationships with other people who were broken and you were taken advantage of, advantage of or you were violated or you were abused. You have been broken in addition to the brokenness that you started with. So you start with brokenness, then you experience brokenness, and then guess what? You bring that to a relationship and it's one big broken mess, Right? So that helps you understand why. And it helps you understand that it's never going to look perfect. It's never going to look perfect. I love what Romans 3 says. It says, none is righteous. No, not one. He says, no one is righteous. And it's almost like he knows someone in the back. He's going to be like, well, I'm pretty close. No, 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 not even you. (laughs) No one is righteous. Nobody is perfect. So no relationship is ever going to look perfect perfect. You have to break that perfect expectation. Otherwise, you will forever be frustrated. You have to say, you know what? We're not going to be perfect. So let me just say this for single people. Single people, that that means stop trying to find the perfect one, the one. You know, like the perfect one. There is no perfect one. The one is a mythical creature that lives at the end of a rainbow next to unicorns and fairies. There is no the one. For married people, this also applies because sometimes you have married people who are like, I'm married, but I think I'm married to the wrong one because I see that one over there. And I think they're the one. No, they're not. The one is the one you're married to. But it's messed up. And that's okay. And that's okay. You're, you're never going to be perfect. There is no finding the one. There is only becoming the one. What we need to focus on is becoming the one that God created us to be. Put our efforts there. Put our energies there. Put our focus there. Put our prayers there. Where do our prayers go? Change them, Jesus, now. How about change me, Jesus, now? 
Like, how about change me from the inside out? You focus on becoming the one. And, and that's, that's our job. See, God, God never promises a perfect relationship. You know what you see a lot in the Bible is a lot of need for repentance. You see a lot of asking for forgiveness. You see a lot of, hey, be patient with one another. Put up with each other. Serve each other. You see a lot of that. And not a lot of this perfect picture. So take that picture out. It's God's idea, but as long as we're in this broken world, it's never going to be picture perfect. Your relationship won't ever be free of faults, but it can be full of grace. It can be, it can be man, we're imperfect. We're not, to, man, we are struggling, but by the grace of God, we're going to be this together. We're going to be in this together. We're going to work on this together. God, help us together. We're not perfect but we're moving towards the one who is, right? And then, and then here's, here's an important definition. It's this, real love isn't lust. Man, this is so important today, and we're gonna, again, unpack this more in the weeks to come, but I have to lay this as a foundation as you define the relationship. If you don't understand that love is not lust, you will devolve into society's definition of love, which honestly, it's just lust, right? Society's all about attractiveness. Society's all about sensuality and sexuality. I mean, look at how, like, sex is into everything. Every music video that's about love, it's all about sex. It's all about sex. That's what it is because that's the world's definition. Look at what the, how the world sells things. Everything from soap to soda. You know, you've got sex selling. It's like, it's like crazy. That's how they define it. That's, that's what they push forward. And if you don't have a proper definition, you will devolve into that definition. That's not God's definition. And if you have that definition, you will miss out on God's definition. Look what the smartest guy in all the Bible outside of Jesus says about love and attractiveness. He says in Solomon, King Solomon says in Proverbs 31, charm is deceptive and beauty is is fleeting. Now that's wisdom. Like that's just smart. Like that's just paying attention. But do you know who said that? Not only was the smartest guy in the world, but that guy had a thousand wives and concubines. Like that's weird. Okay, like that's weird, but he did. So and and most probably he had the most beautiful women in all of the region. In all of the region, a thousand of them. So he had no lack of size and shape, hair color, eye color, ethnicity, personality. He had whatever he wanted, whatever, whenever he wanted it. He had what lust tells you you need. And you know what his takeaway was? Charm is deceptive, beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. You know what his definition was? And lust, it leaves you lacking. Lust doesn't fulfill, it actually robs. Lust focuses on the external, but love focuses on the internal. Lust takes, but love gives. Lust focuses on me and what I want. Love focuses on we and what's best for us. Love is what we want, and it doesn't look like lust. All right, another definition real quick is this. Real love is sacrifice. Real love is sacrifice. And this is what we see in 1 John chapter 4 at the dude who was closest to Jesus while he was on this planet. 1 John 4 says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved his son. He loved us and sent his son as an atoning, what? Say it with me. Sacrifice. 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 You know what real love looks like? Sacrifice. Real love looks like saying, you first. Real love looks like saying, what do you need? Let me take care of it. Is that going to be, that, is that going to help you? I want to do that. Real love looks like saying, it is the last bowl of Cinnamon Toast Crunch. There you go. That's real love. It's sacrifice. It's putting me back and you ahead. Jesus says in John 15, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And then he does it. Right? He proved it. He proved it. 
If you want to win in your relationship, you've got to be willing to become less. It's just the way it works. You want to move forward? God has enacted this principle. If you want to be closer, you've got to become less. You've got to push them forward. Here's some principles real quick. You could write these down. You can take a picture. You will never win in relationship until you're willing to lose. It's not, you will never have the great relationship you want until you become less. And we will unpack this more next week. But, man, this is, this is true. You will never be right in relationship until you're willing to be wrong. It's just the way it is. Again, we'll unpack this, but i got to lay this foundation. you got to be willing to sacrifice. you got to be willing to come less. And who did that? Ultimately, Jesus. The Son of God left heaven, came to earth, lived a perfect life, died a, a, a death he didn't deserve as a sacrifice. Why? So that we could win. He lost so that we could win. This is how this works. How do we, be, how do we experience this then? Well, real love is found when both people in the relationship, continually put God first. Again, you're not going to figure this thing out trying to just do all of those principles but not involving God in the Holy Spirit. you got to bring God into the equation. you got to bring God online. It's the relationship triangle, right? You have God at the top, and then you have person over here, person over here. As you both individually move towards God, what also happens? You move closer to each other. It's just the way it works. So as you set your mind on God, God starts to work in your life. So single people, let me encourage you. How does, what does this apply to you? You're in the waiting zone. What's your job? To get out there, to be hunting, to be looking, you know, no. Your job is to be seeking him. And he'll take care of everything else. I remember I was 23, and I was like, I wanted to be married, and I was like so frustrated because I was like, God, I'm 23. Where is she? I'm so alone. And my wife is six years younger than me, so God's like, she's in high school, dummy. (laughs) I'm keeping you out of jail. Just seek God, right? Just seek God. As you seek God, he will bring the right person at the right time. And it will be his doing and not yours. Do you want what God can give or do you want what you can get? You want what God can give. And you seek him, he'll take care of it. If he's good, if he's good, which he is. Married people, your job, again, to seek the Lord. That's why this this 30 for 30 challenge, I want to encourage you. Take some time. Pray together. Seek God together. Bring God into your relationship. Start sacrificing. Say no to lust. Say yes to love. Say say yes to serving. And bring the Lord into the equation and watch your marriage flourish. Let me give you two stories from people in our church, in our church in the last year, powerful stories of God transformation. Ryan says this, My personal story involves one of taking the world on by myself. I spent my adult life shouldering the challenges of life on my own. If it was to be, it was up to me. I was making a series of choices that were leading down a dark path. I was lost, and my marriage was on the ropes, and my children were learning from all of this in a life without God. As a result, this journey led me to a realization that I could not do this life on my own and that I needed God to be my number one. And through a series of connected circumstances, I asked God for forgiveness and surrendered my life to him. Now I am in a daily fight against the enemy with God as my guide and my number one. My marriage is healing and growing into a strong number two partnership, and my children are smiling and learning to know that about God, and I am saved. God is the center of our family and our life. Come on, isn't that amazing? Yeah. It's the power. It's the power of making him number one. Uh, Katie, separate couple, writes this. My husband and I were weeks away from a divorce finalization. Forgiveness and grace were not in sight. We didn't know who each other were anymore. 
One morning I came home filled with God's love and we sat down and we ripped up the divorce papers. They literally had the divorce papers. We turned to God. We cried out that we wanted the life he planned for us. Today we couldn't love each other more. God is number one in our lives and we rearranged our priorities and threw away our selfishness. We are an example that God's love is greater and stronger than anything. Come on, isn't that incredible? Would you stand with me all across this place? I want to take a moment. I want to just, with all of this as a, as a background, I want to go to prayer. Because listen, you might be struggling. You might be in a relationship, and it's hurting, and it's not what you want it to be. And it's, but God can do anything. I want to encourage you, God can do anything if he could speak the world into existence. And he has these principles, and he wants to help us. He can heal your broken heart. He can heal your marriage if you just look to him. If you're single, you say, God, I'm going to look to you. I'm going to trust you. If you're married and it's not working, just say, God, we're going to look to you. We're going to trust you. If you've been in a relationship and you're just alone right now, you say, God, I'm going to look to you. I'm going to trust you wherever you are. I say, God, it's all about you, and I'm going to look to you. Go across this place. Would you, would you lift your hands as, a, as a, an act of surrender? And if your spouse is next to you, you could just grab their hand as you lift it and say, Lord, we're going to do this for you by your spirit, and we're going to pray. Come on, let's just, let's just lift this up. Father. I pray for every marriage in this place. I pray for every single person. I pray for every divorced person, every person who's going through it, every person who has to counsel those that are in relationships. Lord, we pray that, God, you would be the center of our relationships. And, God, in this moment, we turn away from improper thinking. We turn away from making it about lust. We turn away from making it about us. And we turn towards making it about you and making it about sacrifice. And we want to do this your way. We want to define the relationship the way you do. What's love got to do with it, God? God, it has everything because it's you and you've designed it and you have brought it to our lives. And so, Lord, we say your will be done. God, we want you and your purposes. And we worship you and we thank you. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, all across this place, let's just sing this out. Let's let worship rise up in this house.